Before you take your seats, if you be so kind, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 54 in the Amplified. It is there that you will find our theme verse for this month uh, in Genesis 1, verse 54. Genesis 1, verse 54. If you don't have it, don't let that bother you. It should be on the monitors uh, behind me. Genesis 1, verse 54. Genesis 1, verse 54. Someone get it because I don't have it and it's not on the monitors. Um, so get it, get it for me real quick. I'll give you the gist of what it says. Thank you. The seven years of scarcity and famine began to come as Joseph had said they would. The famine was in all surrounding lands, but in all of Egypt, all of of Egypt, but in all of Egypt, <laughs> there was food. In all of Egypt, there was food. I told you on last week that that scripture it sort of it sort of jumped off the page at me for for a few months now as I've been looking at that passage. I, I just it just it just dawned on me that scarcity hits all of our land, it hits all of our lives in some way, shape, or form at some point in our living. And what was unique about this situation is that the Bible says that a famine hits all of the land, but in Egypt, there was no scarcity, and they actually thrived during scarcity. That led me to just pondering, man, wouldn't that be pretty cool if God's people could figure out how to not flip out and lose it when scarcity shows up, but to thrive in the middle of scarcity. Are y'all listening to me? It is with that thought that we pulled this theme for this month, Living with Margins. Everyone put your hands on yourself and shout, I'm ready. Say, I'm ready to live with margins. Our theme for today's subtopic is accepting the order of God. Now, point at the person that was just putting their hands on themselves and tell them, if you're going to live with margins, you must accept the order of God in your life. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In our opening text or thought, I defined for you the word margins again. For those of you that weren't with us on uh, last week, here is our working definition for margins. Are y'all ready? Margins are the space between you and, y'all tell me what? You and overload. It is the space between same you and crazy, not just crazy, but crazy yelling you. Anybody seen margins dissipate this week? Has anyone seen margins increase this week? All right. It is the distance between victorious you and defeated you. That's called margins. If you had a book, or like I have this program, or this um, book pamphlet, um, if you open any book, this is the book that we're going to be reading during Sunday morning discipleship training. And for those of you that haven't been engaged, I just think it is a perfect match to our sermon series. The name of the book is Crazy Busy. It is a small book. This is not it. It's a pamphlet to encourage you to um, get the book and show up. But it really is a quick read. It really is uh, a necessary read. Uh, the author is very thoughtful, very thoughtful as he talks about the busyness of life. But if you open any book, not just this pamphlet, but any book, what you will find is that words do not run off the pages of any book. They stay within a, yeah, that's called the margin. The, be, the blank space around all, the entire page of every book you read is called margins. Because every writer knows that even in writing, what I need to tell you, I need to leave you some some margins. Some margins are important. Everybody shout, they're important. So if you're feeling stressed, you're not alone. Eight in ten Americans report they frequently or sometimes experience stress in their daily lives, according to a new Gallup poll. Eighty percent of all Americans say, yep, I feel maxed out and overwhelmed about being maxed out from time to time. 
Everybody okay? Stress, as defined by Hans Saley, is to wear, he defines stress as wear and tear on the body by anything, either positive or negative. Now, I want to make sure you see what he says will put stress on you, and that is anything. Anything is a positive or negative. It is interesting that as I was preparing to talk to you guys this week, I was doing some research about stress and about being overwhelmed, and I found it amazing that it is not, um, stress is not an indicator to how hard you're working or how busy you are, because what they've done is they've done studies and they've determined that those who work more with their hands versus their heads or less stressed out than those who work with their heads. Now you say, wait a minute, those who work are working with their hands seem to be working harder. Yeah, but it is this right here that'll wear you out quicker. Are y'all listening to me? I saw some folk look around like, really, you really be, because see, so people, people think that that's working with their hands, they're like, them people in that office ain't doing nothing. They're the most stressed out folk in the whole place. They got more way in town on them than you could ever know. Can't, I need an office worker to shout hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. It, it will wear, it will, this right here will wear you out. Gosh almighty. <laughs> yeah, and, and see the thing, the thing when you work with these, which, which I have done both all of my life, when you work with this, you can sort of you can sort of get done and be done. When you need this, this sort of stays on long after you left the place. And you end up taking work and trouble in the places you should have left it. Y'all listening to me? I said y'all listening to me. So it, it brings upon stress. It wears us out. It wears us out. It wears us out physically, emotionally, mentally relationally it just eats us up everybody shout yes it does so the three greatest stressors in the lives of americans are work family and finances anybody i'm sure y'all can think of some more right now but i'm just saying anybody disagree with those three being right up there at the very top of what wears us out Shell puts it said, in the rafters. Yeah, all the way up. It will have you all the way to the rafters of life. If you just, if you just, if we could just sit down and get some de-stresses around work, around family, and around finance. I, I, I think this is important to talk about because I was considering my opening statement and I thought about the stress that family has put on my wife and I, raising kids, and then worried to death about all that is coming at our kids as they have grown. And I've thought about the, the different personalities that we have raised within our own homes and, and how necessary it has been for both of us to take time loving and beating and loving and beating and loving and beating. Because, you know, it, it takes a little bit of both, a little bit of beating and a little bit of loving uh, to really make them come out okay, I guess. And um, whether or not... <laughs> Well, not, well, you know, I'm not saying that, but uh, it takes a little bit of both. And so I was thinking, man, how much more complicated is this for single parents? And so I just wanted to pause in the middle of my opening and say to every single parent, male and female in the room, listening to me, God bless you. If you have had to do this by yourself, and every, and here's the thing, I do not salute you on, by myself or on my own. Every two-home parent, I mean, every two-parent home in the room is shaking their hand saying, God bless you. Let, we're going to tell you how we feel. Every two-home, every two-parent home that knows that you are maxed out with two folk trying to do this, would you stand and salute every single parent that may be in the room? Yeah, God bless you. <laughs> now, I am of the opinion 
that when life is lived without the established order of God, we as people stress out. When life is lived, y'all tell me again, when life is lived without the order of God, what do we do? We stress out. So I immediately can take this and say, hey, if I'm stressing this week and I can feel it, listen, again, if you think about the definition by Hans Saley, Hans says that the definition of stress is that which is good or bad. As it continues to wear on you, it just brings in stress factors. So what I want you to do is to be able to determine when it has gone from good to bad. There's some things that, that, that come into our lives to help us meet deadlines, to get to where we need to get to and, to, and to perform at a high rate, and that may be good. But there are other things that come to make us stress out and bug out and, 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 and become overwhelmed, and that's not good. Everybody shout, that's not good. And any time that we are outside of the order of God, we find ourselves stressing out. So what's the order of God, Pastor White? What is the order of God? The order of God is just, just this simple. First God, then all else. Let's talk about the order of God. Y'all tell me, what's the order of God? Say it again. Hallelujah. That was, that was better than y'all giving it credit for. When you wake up in the morning... When you go to work, how do I handle these people who are, who are wearing me out at work? When you get your check, and you get your check, and you look at it, and you say, oh, my God, I don't know how I'm going to pay all my bills. When you get home, and you are handling your relationships, and the wife, the husband is about to wear you out. Y'all not listening to me. I don't want you to think I'm only talking about the first part of your day like I ask you to pray with us every day. I'm talking about every area of your life. First God, then all else. If I can determine what God, um, what his order is when handling my finances, first God, then I take care of the other. If I can, handle, if I can understand God's order for relationships, first God, then all else. If I can understand God's order for doing business as a Christian man, Christian woman, first God, then all else. And when I keep God's order in my life, it keeps me from getting into shady business deals. Because why didn't you do this, Pastor White? Because first God, then all else. Hallelujah. Pastor White, why are you not out doing some of the things you were doing before you were unsaved and unmarried? Because first God, then all else. Come on, let's hang out at the club and let's go down to the um to the joint and uh, look at some women. <laughs> no, no, we don't do that. Why you don't do that? Because first God did all else. Well, I love God too. No, I'm not talking about just loving God. I said having God's order in your life. First God then all else. Would you do me a favor and nudge your funny at the neighbor and tell him if you listen, you're going to find out that the order of God can bring margins like nothing else into your life. First God, then all else, then all else. Well, I don't like that, but that's, that's not my problem. First God, then all else. First God, then all else. But, but, but mama, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like the way you're raising me. And my friends down the street, they don't have to go by all these rules and all that. But shut your mouth up, shut your mouth up. Listen to me, listen real good. What, daddy? First God. Then all else. Y'all listening to me? Would you do me a favor and just shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. Say it again. Say it to everybody on your roll. Say it with you. First God, then all else. It's all I want you to think about this week. We, 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 have, we have opportunity for you. We have, hold on, hold on, hold on. First God, then all else. Is there a relationship you're engaged in where God is not welcome? See, see, this right here is going to be a good proof test for you. Is there one where God is not welcome? How does 
this formula fit into that? If it doesn't, you need to reassess it. First God, then all else. Is there anything that you're engaged in where God is not welcome? You need to reassess it using this formula. First God, then all else. When you and your boys are together, y'all out doing your thing, before they, before y'all disrupt one another's lives, you need to just go ahead and let them know what the formula is for you. No reason for you to go over there and jack up them if they're not doing the God thing. But for you, it has to be first. Then, and if you do that, we start to find out that the first God, then all else model it is a de-stressor in life. It brings something to life called margins. Hallelujah. Say it again. So I want to I give you three rewards that come from the order of God in your life. And I find these just from studying God. Now, we saw Joseph and, and the model God had given him. We'll talk about it more. But today, I want to talk a little bit about God himself. And the first thing that I want you to see, the first benefit of first God, then all else, is that accepting God's order in your life, it brings... It brings balance to your life. And I know y'all like, where do monkeys come from? Well, we'll talk about them in a minute. But don't they look, they look pretty balanced, though, don't they? Look like it's all good, don't it? God's order in your life, what does it bring? Balance. What does it bring? Balance. Which means if there's any area in my life where I don't have the order of God, that means I am unbalanced, unbalanced imbalanced, however you want to say it. Have you ever been, have you, have you ever lived your life imbalanced or unbalanced? You ever, you ever had all work, no play? Ever had, had, had all of the world, none of God? It'll get you out of alignment. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? I said, are you with me? Someone, someone shout at me and shout, Pastor White, I need balance in my life if I expect margins in my life. I gave you Genesis chapter 2 as a place of reference, and I just want to tell you what it says without reading all of it. It says that God took the man, this man that he created, and he took the man into a garden that he had created, and he said to the man, I want you to name all of the animals and all the stuff that I created. And Adam was walking with God, the Bible says, in the cool of the day, in the ruach, in the spirit, in the breath of God. Adam was so balanced with God that he was walking in the very breath of what God was saying. It caused him to float. He was such in this vein that he was able to prophetically decree the name of every animal that we know now. They would come in front of him, no name. They were just created, and Adam would say bird. He would say eagle. He would say fish. He would say whale. He would say donkey. He would say cat. He would say doggy. He was just naming everything, doing his thing. And he was just chilling. And he was doing this so well, he thought he had it all together. And God says to him, Adam, it is not good for you to be alone. Adam says, what? I don't understand. All these animals around me, all this beauty of you and I in fellowshipping with one another, and yet you're saying, I'm unbalanced. How can that be? He says, you need a helper. You need earthly relationships to help you be balanced in your life, even though you have the spiritual down. Adam said, wow, God, I didn't know I was out of balance. He says, let's stop talking. Go to sleep. And he took it, went, put him to sleep, went into his rib, poured out a rib, fashioned a woman, brought Adam back to life. You have to read the text. God doesn't talk anymore. Adam just talks. Adam said, whoa, man. And he named her right there. <laughs> Drama, you remember honeymoon night? Whoa, man. That's like, I see you, Adam. I see you. You remember? <laughs> I said, whoa, man, 
Adam, good God Almighty, God knows what he's doing. And that's what happened. And he brought balance to life. Now, here's the thing. Now that I have this woe man, God says to me now, he says, now, don't get out of balance because you need woe man, but you also need God. Y'all with me? And if you say first God, then all else, you get to define what is next on the else line. So one of the homework things that I want you to do, and I want us to talk about it Wednesday night, homework things. Your homework <laughs> um, is I want you to start, to start um, defining what's next on the else line. First God, then, well, what does that look like? What does that look like? What does that look like? What is, what is the else? So God said to, to Adam, he sort of defined for him what should be first on the else line. He says, all right, we are good. Now we need family. And so he says, I want to give you a warm man so that you can become a family. Hallelujah. Y'all see that? Now God does this and doesn't bring them to church yet he, because he's defining what's else. What's next on the else line? Y'all all right? And so when your life is balanced, you feel good. But I put this quote in your notes, and, and I hope that you understand my monkey picture after this. Imbalance is life is, is akin to living in a zoo. When you're out of balance, eventually the monkeys jump off that little uh, rock they were on, and you have chaos. And... And here's the crazy part about it, is that when life is out of balance, living in chaos becomes the new normal. And you think, but I do good in chaos, and I'm, I'm good out of balance. But the truth of the matter is, if you think about our stress definition, it's wearing on you, and eventually it's going to catch up with you. Y'all listening to me? Would you do me and go ahead and shake your neighbor and tell them whatever you do, we have to make sure that you get back Imbalance, because imbalance is going to wear you out before it's all said and done. No, 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 no. Talk to him again. Tell him, I'm telling you this because I love you enough to be around long after all this work and all this stuff that's consuming you is gone. for the monkeys in the zoo to start running the zoo. <laughs> Y'all listening to me? Do me a favor and say that with me. Say, the last thing I want is for... Y'all finish. <laughs> if you're going to have a zoo, they're going to have to be up on that rock the way that way them monkeys were. They're going to have to, at least when you show up, get back up on that rock. They're going to have to get back up on that rock. That's, that's, what, that's the only zoo I can run. Only so I can run. That good? Let's go. Number two. Y'all all right so far? Number two. Second blessing of the order of God is that when you accept the order of God, accepting God's order in your life establishes boundaries for living. It establishes boundaries for living. Boundaries are guidelines, rules, or limits that a person creates to identify reasonable and safe and permissible ways for other people to behave towards them and how they will respond when someone passes those limits. Boundaries. Everybody say it with me. Say it with me. Put your hands on yourself and say, self, the order of God brings boundaries to life and they are necessary if we are going to have margins. Man, so many people live their life and they have forgotten what the boundary lines were. And it is not just you who has done it. In our text in Genesis 2, Adam 
immediately when God creates him, brings him to this garden, he immediately starts to define the boundary lines. He says, you should have dominion over everything crawling and swimming. He says, you can eat from every tree of the garden except two, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that's mine. You can't touch it. God establishes boundaries because you can't live with margins without them. And when we allow people to go over those boundaries, what God does is he helps us to understand whether or not we honestly have them. God says good boundaries look this way. When you have them, you go ahead and tell them. The day that you eat of that tree, I just told you you can't. You shall surely die. When boundary lines are crossed, there are always consequences. There are always consequences when boundary lines, and if there are no consequences, boundary lines will be moved, and you will start operating as if you were in an imbalanced zoo. The monkeys are running the place. If you notice my picture, I have a little guy on a little motorcycle, motorcycle, and he is coming up on a stop sign, but that little squarehead joker going to run by it, ain't it? And it is up to every parent and every adult to say, little squarehead joker, you can, you can ride that motorcycle over on the right side, but you come past here, you have crossed the boundary for which there are consequences. Now, that is true not just for the little square-haired boy, but that is true for everybody in life. Husband and wives, you have to establish boundaries. What, what, are we, what, what, what is acceptable and unacceptable? When I do this with, with couples, I tell them, me and my wife already know she almost broke a boundary rule for us this week. She almost did. And she didn't even know I was going to call her out on it, but it just came to me. Thank you, Holy Ghost. <laughs> My wife and I know, because we, we, we come from the wrong sides of the track. We know when we got married that we established that she and I, we don't have a revolving door. You don't, come, you don't stay out of my house past a certain hour without, I'm talking about a whole lot of contact. So Friday night... <laughs> My wife said, I'm going to get my hair done at Sister Tyshell's. She said, baby, I have a 6 o'clock appointment. I said, yep, that should be right around the time that you can be getting back in before our boundaries are broken. <laughs> we shouldn't have any boundary problems. 7 o'clock pass, 8 o'clock pass, 9 o'clock pass, 10 o'clock, I'm pacing. I said, oh, Lord, not little square head, not little square head, <laughs> not little square head. <laughs> And she was on the little motor pad. Y'all see it up there? And I said, oh, oh, boy. I text, you okay? I called, are you okay? She says, yes, baby. It, it's, it's, it's taking a little longer. It's Mother's Day weekend, okay. Around 11.45 or so, I had already told the Lord, look like my wife's going to be spending the night at the shop tonight. Because <laughs> once a new day hits, it's a new day. <laughs> I looked at my watch and she called right at 11.45. She said, I'm on my way. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, oh. I'll see you when you get here. <laughs> she said, well, I I'll see you when you get here. Bro. I got myself together. You, uh, Brother Walter is looking at me. God, God Almighty, Sister Tyshell is breaking down boundaries. He's looking at me, and what my wife did to help me, to help soften how I was feeling, is she said, baby, and Sister Janika Bennett was after me. So I know why you're shaking, Brother Walter, because your wife came home later than my wife. <laughs> we will have cameras on that shop <laughs> next week. <laughs> but when boundaries are broken, <laughs> when boundaries are broken, there must be consequences. I said to my wife, I said, baby, it is a little too late to spend time in this bed tonight. And she said, if you in it, I'm getting in it. And I said, well, that is one of our boundaries. We don't sleep in other rooms. We sleep together. But every family should have boundaries. 
Every relationship must have boundaries. Here's the reality. You say, but I don't know how to talk to people or how to set them up. I know this. You know when boundaries have been crossed because you feel a certain way. Emotionally, there's a detector inside that says, that was too far. That was too much. Y'all listening to me? What does, that, what does that detector tell you? That was too much. Do me a favor and just shout it with me. Shout boundaries, please. Tony Gaskin said, you teach people how to treat you by what you allow, what you stop, and what you reinforce. Tony Gaskin said, you teach people how to treat you by what you allow, what you stop, and what you reinforce. Everybody shout, huh. Say it again. All right. Last, when you accept the order of God, what's the order of God? First, then, when you have that in your life, accepting God's order in your life allows you to take a break. I'm just going to tell you, if you are living right now, if you are in here and you don't know how to take a break, you have little margins. But I'm busy. Everybody in this room busy. But you don't know. You don't know. It's going to kill you. You have to take a break. You have to take a break. Would you put your hands on yourself and say, self, you have to take a break before you break. Hospitals are full of people who simply could not take a break, and so they broke. But I'm climbing the ladder of success, I'm telling you. I told you that, that, that one author, I won't be able to give him credit because it wasn't in, my, wasn't in my notes, but he talked about Americans, and he said, you Americans, and I'm paraphrasing, he was given an interview, and he said, you Americans confuse me, Sister Gail. And the interviewer says, why do you say we Americans confuse you? He said, because y'all spend all your health trying to get money, after which you spend all your money trying to get health. Y'all so quiet. I don't know if this church or, or, or lecture hall. Y'all all right? <sighs> Say this with me. I need a break because God took a break. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 says, God created the heavens and the earth in six days and on the seventh day, he rested. Now, if God took a break, good God Almighty, surely God's children going to have to take a break. McDonald's was not lying. You need a break today. You need a break today. Y'all all right? Say it with me. Say it with me. I must learn to take consistent breaks. Say this with me. I am not myself without a break. Now, I didn't put this in your notes. I took it out, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. There are studies that have been done that say that you, the average worker, employee, employer, are not at their optimum unless they take a 15-minute break or better every 60 to 90 minutes. The brain will not function at its optimum unless it gets those intervals, unless it gets those breaks. And, and if you do studies, everybody knows that people who are on the clock for 8, 9, 10 hours don't actually do productive work for that 8 or 10 hours. Y'all listening to me. You know why? Because you were still at the keyboard, but you were taking a break. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
So if that is true, how can we do better? How can we do better about giving our best? I'm telling you that there are times when I'm thinking and, and meditating and, and, and all the above about everything I have to do, and I'm working, and it just is not coming. I ain't sitting there at the keyboard. I just like, this ain't it. And I just say, you know what? I'm done. I have built-in breaks for my life. I'm, I'm just done. I don't care. I know what, I, I, no more, not now. I take a good exhale, chill out, just do breaks my way, and guess what happens? The computer reboots a little later. Right. Creativity comes back, and old white doing this thing. And then I hit that little wall, and instead of sitting there for the rest of the night, go in and cut it off. Wait on it to come back. Y'all with me? Husband and wives. Y'all can keep doing y'all thing and taking care of everybody else except for yourself if you want to. Y'all need, <laughs> y'all need a break. I talk to families all the time that are parents to, to young kids and they tell me how they haven't had a date in I don't know how many years and everything else. And I say, man, I'm going to tell you, y'all going to have to get a break. I have to. It will stress out your relationship. That fair? My time is up. We'll end this way. Because I want you to see this. I want you to see how important breaks are for God. Jesus is with his disciples in John chapter 11. I'll tell you the story. You don't have to go there. Go there on your own time. He's with his disciples. He is taking a break. He has been working. He has been performing miracles. He's on a break. But some friends that he cares a lot about, named Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, have a problem. Their problem is that Lazarus has fallen dead. Lazarus has fallen dead. Mary and Martha, his sisters, get someone to run down to Jesus in the city down the street to tell him that his friend has is, is fallen dead, deathly ill, and he needs to get there right away. The Bible says that Jesus said to his disciples, this sickness is not unto death. And the Bible says Jesus continued his break for two days. I know you've never seen it that way. That's why we have to see it. The Bible says that Jesus continued to take a break for two more days. Pause for a moment. You have to stop making everybody else's emergency your emergency before it's time. If Jesus stayed on break, you're going to have to go ahead and take a break. You'll be better because you took it. What did Jesus know, Pastor White? He knew that a tired me showing up in Nazareth might hinder a miracle, but it refreshed me, hallelujah, or restored me, might release a miracle. For two days he stayed, and when he showed up, Mary and Martha met him upset. People who don't understand your boundaries will not understand your breaks, and they will get upset with you for taking them. But that's okay. You're positioned to release a miracle. A refresh you, a restore you, can release miracles. A refresh you, a restore you, can make things happen. A worn out you needs a miracle. A worn out you needs a miracle. Jesus shows up. They said, if you had been here, my brother would have died. I can't believe you stayed on break. I'm paraphrasing. I can't believe you waited all this time. It's two days later. And Jesus, I thought you loved us. And Jesus took it all because he's refreshed now. He has margins. And he listened to all of it and he said, show me where you lay it. He said, take me too. The one you say, I wasn't here for. And he goes over to the tomb where they laid Lazarus. And he yells into the tomb what only a refreshed and restored vessel can do. Lazarus, come forth. And immediately, because Jesus took a break, Lazarus came forth. The thing that had died 
came back to life when a refreshed vessel of God showed up. I don't know what's been dying around you, but I know that if you get refreshed in the presence of God, if you submit to his order, you're going to find that he is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. And if the enemy can get you overwhelmed and worn out, you may actually hinder a miracle from taking place where God is raising you up. Every hour.